friend calls me one Saturday afternoon to go shopping for a TV. And we walk into the store, and he says to the sales guy, I need an HD TV, but it's got to have 1,080 pixels per square inch. And he whispers to me, and he says, you know, 760 is not enough. And then he starts in with the contrast ratios. Between the whites and the darkest of the darks, it could go anywhere from 10,000 to 1 to 10 million to 1. So I have to compare these sets side by side. And then he starts in with the external ports and the HDMI pin configuration. So I look at him and I said, when did you get your PhD in TV? <laughs> and he says, oh, I've been searching the internet hours every day and I went into these electronic chat rooms and I got all this information. And he makes a decision on the model. I say, terrific. Let's buy it and leave. And he says, we're going from here to Best Buy because I'm going to get a better price. Do you know the average American spends twice as much time researching what TV to buy than deciding on which physician to choose? You see, buying a TV is the ultimate consumer experience because the three things that drive consumers, price, quality, and desire, are all in play. In this country, a consumer-driven healthcare system has been the strategy for the last decade. The idea is we give consumers, patients, their own healthcare dollars, and they would spend it, and that would drive down price and increase quality, just like shopping for a TV. But you see, the strategy is not working, because those three conditions, price, quality, and desire are all not working in our current healthcare model. So let's start with price. You see, price is related to value. You go for a $500,000 house, it should be better than a $100,000 house. A $60,000 car should be better than a $20,000 car. The question is, can you shop for the better physician based on price? And the answer is no. Let's say I have a fever and a cough. I could go to three physicians on my health plan. Physician A makes the wrong diagnosis and gives me the wrong treatment. He gets paid $100. Physician B gets a chest x-ray, figures out I have pneumonia, but gives me the wrong antibiotic. He gets paid $100. Physician C, she makes the right diagnosis that I have pneumonia, and she gives me the right antibiotic, she gets paid $100. The physician who made the wrong diagnosis and the physician that probably saved my life gets paid the same. You see, patients can't shop using price to determine differences about who's the better doctor. So now let's talk about the second condition, quality. Can, fish, can, can patients shop for the better physician or the more qualified physician. And you know what? It's hard. My father calls me one day. How are you doing, Dad? And he says, uh, better. What do you mean better? He says, I had my hernia operated on yesterday. I said, Dad, who did it and where did you go? He said, oh, this really nice guy at the local hospital. I said, Dad, you do remember that your son, that would be me, is a surgeon, right? <laughs> I could have found you the best person out there. He goes, oh, no. He says, this was a really nice guy. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says he served donuts in the waiting room. <laughs> donuts. You see, patients like to use service to determine physician quality. Do they call you back? Do they have evening office hours? Is the staff nice? Is there adequate parking? Do they serve donuts? <laughs> but you see, the real measurement of physician quality is judgment and experience. 
Now, I just want to say, we heard this morning from Ed an amazing story of a guy who survived surgery after a stab wound to his neck and his inferior vena cava. I could tell you as a vascular surgeon, 95 to 99% of people do not survive a stab wound to their inferior vena cava. But you see, what the difference was is his surgeon had amazing judgment and experience. But it's really hard for people to determine that. They have to do a lot of digging. They have to ask questions which frequently they don't know what they are and they frequently don't even know who to ask. You see, there is no consumer reports for judgment and experience. So finding good healthcare physicians, quality physicians, is much less tangible. It's not like when you shop for a car where your drive's better or your coffee maker that makes a better cup of coffee. It's hard for patients. And that gets us to the third issue around what drives consumer. And that's desire. Do you want it? So I want you to imagine, as a parent, that you're told that without any intervention, your child is going to lose an arm or a leg. So I get a call from the Chinese embassy. And they tell me about these parents who are in China who want to come over here to bring their child for me to operate on. And it turns out this child has multiple abnormalities of his blood vessels going to his arms and legs. And these are bubbles. They're known as aneurysms. As the child gets bigger, the arteries get bigger, the bubbles get bigger, and eventually they rupture, and it's a disaster, and you lose an arm or a leg. So these parents, they go from their village to the, to the closest city, and they search the English language literature, medical literature, and they find actually that I've reported on this and operated on a bunch of kids with this entity. By the way, this is pre-Google. They save up their money, they borrow some money from some other villages, they negotiate through the whole Chinese-American embassy issues, and they get their child to the U.S. for me to operate on. Think about what those parents did, the drive and the desire. So you see, it's amazing what people will do when they really want something. It's also amazing what people won't do when they don't want something. And that gets us to the third major issue about why consumer-driven health care isn't working. People don't want health care. Now, you're going to say, well, geez, this guy's crazy. This is ridiculous. Of course people want health care. Ask anybody, what's the most important thing in your life? And they'll say, my health. But let's look a little bit about how people are behaving. People who have high deductible plans are not spending money on basic health care. People who put away pre-tax dollars in health savings accounts are saving the money and not spending it on basic health care. And what's even more stunning, if you look at people enrolled in high deductible plans and who have money in health savings accounts, their health is actually worse. Mammography rates, cervical cancer rates, colonoscopy screening, and diabetes testing are all lower in people in those plans. Now, I don't want to embarrass this incredibly intelligent group of healthcare professionals, but I'm pretty sure that less than 50% of you over the age of 50 has had your screening colonoscopy. I used to work for a company. They paid us $5,000 a year if we had a stress test, colonoscopy, and annual physical. Because if they didn't pay us the $5,000, less than 10% of the executives had it done. Think about that. You know the co-pays that we ask people to pay, the extra $20 or $50 when they go to a physician or they go to get a test done or they get a prescription filled? Those people don't spend the money on co-pays. And in fact, most major employers in this country are removing co-pays so that they'll have a healthier workforce because those people will get better basic health care. In fact, 
they're actually incenting people. We're paying people to get basic health care so that they'd have the necessary testing done. So not only do we people not want health care, but in fact, we have to give it away or incent people to get it. Now there's one huge exception where people shop around for the best doctor and price. We're talking the fountain of youth, cosmetic surgery. <laughs> Straighter noses, less wrinkles, bigger breasts, smaller breasts, higher breasts, flatter tummies. Last year, Americans underwent 9.5 million cosmetic surgeries for a consumer cost of $10.7 billion. People willing to pay the money. You see there, they could see good quality results. They just have to look at their friends. They also could see bad results. Crooked eyebrows. Lips four times the size of Angelina Jolie. <laughs> Breasts pointed in the wrong direction. And then there's the, my favorite one, the Manhattan Cat Lady. I don't know if you heard about her. She spent over $2 million in cosmetic surgery to make herself look like a cat because her husband likes big cats. How counterintuitive is it that people will spend thousands of dollars on plastic surgery, but they won't spend hundreds of dollars on basic health care? So you see, it's all about desire. Intense desire trumps all barriers. See, so what I imagine is not a consumer-driven health care system, but a desire-driven health care system where people want health care for themselves as much as they want for their children. You see, I imagine that the same friend who did all the research around TVs, I imagine and hope that he's going to call me one day and he's going to, the conversation is going to go like this. He's going to say, I need an operation. I researched and I found a surgeon who does more than 200 of these complex cases and he has a, more, a complication rate of 2.2%. I'm going to have to travel out of state to see him. It may cost me some more money because he's out of network, but it's worth it. It's my health. But there's one small issue, he says. This physician, he doesn't serve donuts in his waiting room. <laughs> Thank you very much.